Welcome to the YWAM Kona podcast. I'm John Mark Dyer, and I'm here with Chad Causey from One Hope Ministries. Yeah. Down in Florida. Yes, yes. Our international offices are in South Florida. Okay, you are the Chief Strategy Officer, which is an epic title. (laughs) Thanks. And uh, I think what I want people to know immediately before we get into this conversation, what they're going to get from it. And I'm thinking... If they're going to listen to the next, you know, however long we talk, they're going to be able to walk away and, and be like, if I want to change the world, if I'm going to, if I want to make an impact, you're going to tell them what is the most important bullseye that young people, I mean, one of the, there's probably many, but yeah. what are some of the most important bullseyes that they should aim at? No, hundred percent. From my perspective, that's the only thing we're talking about. Come I on. Mean, if you were in our family, you'd laugh because you'd hear us talk with our kids and be like, it's the only reason they got out of the bed in the morning. The reason you get out of bed is to change the world. If you're not changing the world, you're wasting your life. Spoken like a true chief strategy. That, that's the deal. That's the deal. So That's awesome. So you were telling me that One Hope impacts or interacts with over like 150 million children around yeah. the world. Tell, a- tell annually, me a little bit. Annually, yeah, annually. So, <clears throat> so One Hope is probably the biggest ministry you've never heard of and we're kind of okay with that, kind of not. We, we sort of are two minds about it. Um, because what we do is we want to work with uh, local Christian communities, local churches, to reach local children, youth, and families with the most dynamic, powerful expression of God's Word that we can create together. Mm. So, you know, once upon a time, probably like a lot of ministries, we would create products and then we'd go out and we'd be like, hey, can we talk you into using our product? You know, and it's like good products, not bad, you know, uh, harmony of the gospels where you put the gospels in chronological order or like little portions of scripture, whatever. And over the years, God really led us to to take on a posture of, of humility and he caused us to understand at a deeper level that if we're going to be motivated by love, then we we can't start with ourselves. We have to start with the one that we're trying to serve. Yeah. And wow. so that's both the local Christian community or local church and it's local children, youth, and families. And so that got us into research. And once we got into research, man, now you're talking serious localization. And we went from having dozens of programs or products to hundreds because we were committed to saying we want to to build with you what you need. And we need to hear that from you. So we got into research. We began presenting the research to national church movements and Christian leaders like we reinvented ourselves over the over a period of about five years because we were committed to this idea We don't want to just do ministry. We want to design ministry. And we want to design ministry for actual fruitful impact. We want to change the world. Right. And if we're going to change the world, it means we don't operate according to our preferences or according to what we like doing or even according to what it's easy to raise money doing. Yeah. We, we, We design everything starting with what does obedience to the faith in Christ look like in this context? And that means research. Wow. So, okay. We, give me, give me a story on that one. Like where, where is the community you went in, you found out what a need was or what, yeah, you know, some interesting fact. Yeah, let me, <laughs> sure. Sure. Let me, I, I, I should have come with a whole bucket full of stories cause we've got them. You know, we were in Madagascar and we, we did research in Madagascar and there was a, 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 a cultural tradition that on an annual basis, you, you dig up the dead. Um, you clean their bones. Wow. You uh, honor them. Uh, you update them on your life in a more elaborate setting. Maybe you put them in the passenger seat of your car. You drive them around, kind of show them like how the city's changed. Wow. It's <laughs> different. Super different. Like from, from our perspective, makes no sense in, in their perspective, in their tradition. Uh, it did. Yeah. And so... You know, how do we go about presenting the resurrection? Well, how do we think about life everlasting, the resurrection of Christ, uh, moving towards a, a glorious reunion with him that's going to be embodied? Yeah. But that in the meantime, those who are dead are are in the faith are with him. Like, how do we rebuild from scratch a biblical theology of, of death and resurrection in the age to come yeah. in that sort of context. 
So, I mean, that's Fascinating. research, that's conversations with, with local partners, that's piloting, it's trying out like different types of products and actually presenting it to children, youth, or families and seeing what their response is, making sure they actually understand what we're saying. So it's, we had to do a bunch of work. None of us are used to this either. Like, yeah. okay, so we have to do a bunch of work to go, hey, can we actually talk with them? And here's what was amazing. By the time our pilot projects were done and we were ready to, to sort of go prime time with the program, we saw measurable increases like, wait a minute, this practice is not according to scripture. Okay, my tradition, here's where my tradition is, is in tension with the Bible and, and I'm going with the Bible. Like we could see hmm. those gains among children and youth as we, as we surveyed them before the program and after the program. And we wow. go, okay, now we're finally starting to get somewhere. You know, I guess what I would say is, if you're in Southeast Asia and you're going, look, everybody's dying from water practices, so we're going to create a new program around health and hygiene. If you're in Southern Africa and it's HIV AIDS and you're going, look, if if people think the measure of, of my status as a person is my sexuality, if that's the primary commodity which I have to trade with... yeah. Well, I mean, you've got to do a, a bunch of different things there. So that's the I Matter program. Like, like each of these realities called forth a different approach from God's word, always centered on Christ, obviously. Always thinking about the grand story of scripture, what we would call the meta narrative, right? Always thinking about sort of the arc of human history and what is God trying to do in the world and incorporating all of that as the foundation for whatever we're going to share, whether we're talking about leadership or health or self-esteem hmm. or family life and parenting or recovering from abuse. So we've got a, okay. a great program that we did with World Vision and it's called Journey to Hope. It's for young women who've been traumatized by abuse. Well. So, so we're doing all these different programs, but what they all have in common is, first of all, a, a theological, a deep theological, and, and, and we believe spiritual commitment that um, your effort, uh, even if your motives are right, your effort uh, is not enough if you're not pursuing bearing fruit in the life of the one that you're called to serve. Right? Like Absolutely. that is the definition of love yeah. for us. So for us, what it means to operate out of love is that I suspend my own preferences. I, like Paul, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to become all things to all men so that by all means I might see some saved. Yeah. And so that means research because I don't already know, right? We're trying to minister to the other. And, you know, your listeners wouldn't know this, but uh, one hope is this tiny organization with massive hundreds of thousands of volunteers and partners around the world. So very, very indigenous mm. in our work, right? Our, our U.S. staff, our international staff is very, very small. And actually, the, the irony is we've tried to keep it small because it makes us better at partnering. The yeah. smaller our teams are, the better we partner because we can't just go do it on our own. And so it, it helps us to fight for and defend kind of a high ecclesiology, yeah. help us to really stay focused on serving local partners, local church leaders, or local ministries. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I could give you more examples, but I, I well, think you get the idea of yeah. like, this is the the sort of basic model that we're following to to try and think about having impact. Yeah. Okay. Tell me, tell me why children and, sure. and why, why the Bible? Yeah. No, great, great questions. So and I have to answer it probably like um, like a lot of things in the YWAM world. Like I have to answer that with two answers, right? The first was divine revelation. Okay. And the second was really good social sciences. So we, we lead and follow from a place of, of thus saith the Lord. But then we, we do our homework to try and really understand why the Lord is leading us in the way he is. And that, yeah. that brings us into other related things disciplines. He's got a good reason. He's got a good reason, right? So, you know, we we don't want to be like Jesus here where it's like, you know, you 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 can discern the weather but like you can't figure out the times that you're living in. Like, no, we or or you know, you you're not as wise as the children of this age. Like I, you know, when he tells yeah. the story of the uh, unjust steward, he's like I, I wish you would just grow in some wisdom. So, 
God spoke supernaturally to our founder in 1987. So we had been uh, a publishing company, uh, and we were the largest publishing company of Bibles and Bible helps in French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Mm. And God spoke to our founder, Bob Hoskins, who's been serving the Lord full time since he was seven years old. And no, for the record, we don't think that that's like super typical or normal. We think it's supernatural and like yeah. all good. And and interestingly, Bob and Lauren are great friends and and have been in each other's lives their whole lives. Yeah. So I heard Bob was in Lauren's wedding yeah. <laughs> and Lauren was in Bob's wedding. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So, um, so God spoke supernaturally to Bob, and he gave him a vision. And what was interesting was because of Bob's life story, uh, Bob never had a normal childhood. Like, he never hung yeah. out with other little kids, right? I mean, he was, he was surrounded by adults from the time he was seven years old. Like he's, doing, wow. he's doing national preaching crusades across the country way back in the day. Um, and, uh, and so at this point in his life in, in uh, 1987, the Lord speaks to him supernaturally gives him this vision that just crushes him. And the vision is about the coming destruction of a generation of children. Well, it's crazy. So in this vision, I mean, literal full on like vision, like apostle Paul, I know a man caught up in the spirit, like that kind of thing. Vision, right? Not like good idea. And I call yeah. it a vision, vision, vision. God gives Bob a supernatural vision and shows him all of these forms of destruction, prostitution, child soldiering, uh, pornography, media, I mean, just all this stuff. And Bob, who's never been like a guy working with children, never yeah. a Sunday school teacher, like none of that stuff, didn't even have a normal childhood, is completely broken wow. and, and cries out to God, what is it you want me to do with what you've shown me? And when you talk with Rob, Bob's son, he says, you know, for, for weeks, like my dad, like he would mention kids and he just starts sobbing. It was just Whoa. so powerful. And the Lord spoke to Bob and he said, the only thing that will rescue this generation is the truth found in my word. I want you to bring my Holy word cow. to the children and youth of the world and you'll do it through leaders. And so since 1987, wow. that's all we do is is every sort of innovative, impactful way that we can develop as God leads us working with his people to bring his word in a thousand different forms to the children, youth of the world and to do it through leaders. That's Jeez. all we do. Wow. Okay. And so we've done that 2 billion times. 2 billion times? 2 billion times. Yeah. So this year it'll be about 145, 150 million children, youth, and families we'll work with, with programs. Yeah. Then Holy we'll cow. we'll serve other ministries with open resources, products, research, money. We'll give money to other ministries. Like we'll do anything we can yeah. to catalyze a movement in the global church so that every child in every generation for 100 years is engaged with Jesus through his word. Yeah. So we've said we will decrease... We will give it all away. I mean, we literally use the metaphor of catalyzation, right? So yeah. in a chemistry experiment, for anybody who cares about chemistry, I'm not a good chemistry guy because I'm lousy at math, but I'm told that the catalyst at the end of the reaction is gone. And uh, 10, 13, 13 years ago, we formally made the decision that we were okay with that. Wow. So it was give it all away. And if we stop, that's okay. But what we want to accomplish as God enables us to, is to catalyze a movement in the yeah. global church that engages every child in every generation with Jesus through his word. And we, you know, as Christians, like sometimes we can be really guilty of slogans. So, so for us, if you came into our world, what you would be struck by is the seriousness with which we operationalize every one of the words I just said. Like yeah. you would find departments that are doing the projects that are necessary to catalyze the movement in the global church that engages every child and every generation with Jesus through his yeah. word. You would find the technologies that are being created. You would see the teams working on AI. You'd see app developers. You'd see films. You'd see open resource. You'd see researchers. Yeah. Like you would see hundreds of people deadly serious about mm -hmm. obedience to the word that God gave us. And then the second piece of that is you would also see hundreds of people going, 
I need to understand my craft yeah. as a as a, as a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. I need to rightly handle the word of truth. But some of the truth that God has given us is in the natural sciences. It's mm-hmm. in the social sciences. It's in leadership and management theory. It's in like I, I've got to go master those as well, right? So we're definitely people of two books, right? Yeah. General and special revelation, both. And it's not that we uh, want to be educated for education's sake, but rather we we take. Okay, so so let me give you an example. So. If you're going to design a a scripture program for young people, one of the things that you probably should think about is how do you make the program sticky? How do you make it We're talking about an app on the phone. It could be an app. It could be a physical product. It could be a a film. It could be uh, a series of oral Bible lessons over the course of 12 to 16 weeks. It could be a two-year Sunday school curriculum. We do all of that. Yeah. So how do you make it sticky? Well, as soon as you want to make it sticky, right? That's sort of language that sometimes we use, right? you want to sustain engagement. So as soon as you want to sustain engagement, well now quickly you're into the field of behavioral psychology and gamification. Yeah. So if you've never heard of gamification, I mean, let me introduce you to a great name. If if you're hearing me like, go check out Yukai Chow. He came up with something called the Octalysis Framework. You can watch his talk at Google. He's a pretty credible guy. By yeah. the way, he's also a devoted follower of Jesus. Whoa. He's super serious about how can he serve the church? And so what you're going to find is like, hey, we know how to make these programs uh, more engaging for young people. So let's do that. And all of us have felt that. Like all of us have felt the the gap where like, uh, you know, maybe a little kid comes to our area. We're a Sunday school teacher. We're leading children's church or minister or something like that. And we give them like a little coloring sheet. And then they walk out to their car and they get on an iPhone. And you're like, okay, this is a painful gap. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. How, how do you how do you compete? Yeah. And so, what we're trying to do is, you know, not just with technology, although technology is a critical part, right? Yeah. So, so the Bible app for kids, it has a hundred million users. It's the the most downloaded uh, Bible engagement for young children in the world. And God gave us the opportunity to build that with you version. It was an incredible privilege, and we we love it, and and that's awesome. But I would tell you, like, we were working back in the day with another ministry called Scripture Union, and they were saying, hey, we're running these Bible clubs, but we really have trouble making sure that the attendance is consistent. Could you help us develop something? And so we came up with these cool trading cards. Doesn't require electricity, doesn't require um, connectivity, doesn't even require literacy, right? Because literacy is its own technology. And so what would happen is, the, each of the cards had a story that made sense based on the research for that context. But on the back, if you collected all of them, it created one big poster that you could tape together and that a child could have that would walk them through the meta narrative of scripture. Whoa. So the front of the card was the individual stories that made sense for their context. The back of the card was just the grand story of the Bible. And here's the deal. If you miss a week, you miss the card. You miss the card. Genius. So all of a sudden it's like, so, so I don't, I don't, you know, when we think about innovation or, yeah. um, or trying to improve our work, sometimes it gets really like, well, yeah, but you're only talking about a certain percentage of the world or that sounds really American. But I would say that innovation is any process that you take that tries to improve, um, the lives of people you love. Like that's love like that. innovation yeah. is motivated by love. And and I I mean, you know, people may agree, disagree. I, I will tell you, like, if if the whole world is changing and you're doing the same thing you've always done, the burden of proof is on you to demonstrate why that still constitutes love. Yeah. Cause I'm not buying it unless you like unless you can really help me understand. Like the whole world's changing. This is what your tradition's been doing for a hundred years. You're not changing a thing. I'm going, mm, that, that sounds like, that sounds like you, like we have a theological problem. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, the impetus for innovation is love because yeah. innovation is hard. Right. It's thankless. It's fraught with failure. It's expensive. Yeah. It makes you feel like an idiot when you get it wrong, which is like tons of the time. So the only reason you do innovation is because you're motivated by love. So if you want to change the world. Yeah. 
which is the question yes. we started with. Mm -hmm. If you want to change the world, then I would ask you, you know, number one, what is your theology of innovation? And number two, what is your theory of innovation? Like, how do you practice it? And if you don't have a theology of innovation or a theory of innovation, if you're just out there shooting randomly, then I would want to invite you to upgrade your skills. Yes. Motivated by love to say, I, I can't accept anything less than the best that I could do under the leading of the Holy Spirit to try and see real fruit produced in real people's lives. Yeah. And so what that means is I need to care about outcomes, not just outputs. Yeah. Um, I've got, I mean, so the Bible uses the term of fruit, the construct of fruit. So, so fruit represents legitimacy, sustainability. It represents harvest. Like the Bible uses fruit in a number of different ways in our contemporary world as, as nonprofits or as ministries, we, we might say outcomes, but it's the same thing, right? It's fruit that will last. So if you want to bear fruit that will last, um, then that actually requires a lot of work. And for anyone who's ever worked in agriculture, like they already know that like fruit doesn't just happen. Yeah. Like it, it takes a lot of work to do that and it can be improved over time. So for us, in early stages, it's like, how do we really understand the situation of the other? How do we listen really well? Yeah. How do we do research? And on the back end, it's what are the what are the feedback loops that are giving us insight into what we're doing? Yeah. And what needs to be corrected? Yeah. Because uh, we probably didn't get it right the first time. Fascinating. Okay, so what is what are the ages that you're focused on? Mm. Is it children? Is it teenagers? The yeah. Whole? No. Great question. So. Uh, if you're in our world, you would probably run into us as a, a, maybe you can talk. Okay. Maybe you can talk when you meet us and that'd be the Bible app for kids. So, yeah. uh, a not insignificant portion, this cracks us up, a not insignificant portion of Bible app for kids users, uh, clicked around on their parents' phone, uh, and they're two to three years old. Okay. And they, they, they know, they already know how to download an app. So for parents like me, I've got four kids, like a three-year-old knows how to navigate the app store and look for something shiny, yeah. like just word to the wise. Um, so that would probably be your first encounter with us. And then we've got a uh, daily Bible experience with you version. We would be in public and private schools around the world offering print products we would be planting churches out in villages, showing beautiful films. Yeah, uh, we're so doing we're all with teenagers of that. as well. So we work with teenagers. We work with youth. We we even work right up into the college years now. Okay. So and the reason for that, you know, the um, the concept of adolescence is um, that's a flexible concept, right? Okay. So really, what you're trying to what you're trying to do is to say like where are people at from a life stage perspective, and if someone is still sort of forming their identity, figuring out their where yeah. they are in life, uh, they're still in adolescence. And, and here's what, a, a few years ago, we began to really wrestle with this issue, right? The, the great exodus that we see, and we can talk a little bit about the research that, that really struck us with this, um, the great exodus that we used to see back in the day among young adults or older teens from church, yeah, that's a global phenomenon now. That's, that's not just a U.S. phenomenon, not a Western phenomenon. That's a global phenomenon. I've talked with uh, house church leaders in China who, who told us the exact same thing. Wow. Right? We've, we've talked with, you know, uh, church leaders in East Africa and rural areas that are, that are talking yeah. about this. So Is this coming out of that global youth culture yeah, survey so, that you've so done? Yeah, so we've done, yep. So we've okay. done, um, as God began to challenge us to think about outcomes, we had to prioritize research. So we began to do serious research, big research studies, um, starting in about 2000, about 2008. Okay. And so in 2008, we launched uh, an attitudes and behaviors of youth study. So that was a big study. It was, so let's see, that was, uh, that was 240,000 participants. Holy cow. I mean, like big, big, How many big, big study. 
uh, 45 countries. Wow. Uh, quantitative, really good methodology. We randomized schools, randomized grades within schools, randomized classes within grades, like really solid. And um, we looked at six domains. So we looked at uh, family composition, family quality. So just sort of family mm -hmm. stuff, uh, lifestyle, beliefs and behaviors, and then religious beliefs and behaviors. And we, we did a deep dive on it. And, and the things that we saw were, were powerful. But, you know, that was, that was, 13, it was 13 years ago. It was a long time ago. Like in the mm -hmm. world of census, when you're doing research that big, like you don't do it every year. So then, so that gave us some really powerful insight into where young people were. And then in uh, 2015, we finished a second study. And so from, hold on, this sure. survey, it shows like maybe their felt needs, their beliefs, their worldview. Yeah. So that you can it. find their pain points, like All where to connect with yeah, them. Yeah, bridges and barriers, right? So as, as, <clears throat> as missional leaders, we're trying to think about how do we connect the gospel to the reality, the pain, the brokenness, the opportunities, the, the values, yep. the strengths, the things that should be celebrated, like all of the above. How do we yeah. connect the gospel? And so uh, the attitudes and behaviors of youth gave us just thousands of the, the data was so big that we had to like back then there was no cloud computing, Amazon Web Services, none of that existed. So we actually had to like fly the hard drives. To, to move around the data set okay. it was so big. It was the largest quantitative research on adolescent beliefs and behaviors conducted in the history of mankind. It was Holy huge. Cow. Um, millions and millions and millions of points of data. So with paper, pencil, hilarious. Like we had to have it all in code. It was, it was a big job. So so then in 2015, we thought, okay, but but really, like guys, there's a second half to this conversation, right? We've got to look at what the church is doing with young people, right? Yeah. Like, like we're hearing from the young people, but now we need to hear from the church about young people. So we launched a second study um, that we called an asset map, right? So an, an asset map in the social sciences is just like, hey, what's already being done out there? Who's doing it? What's working? What's not? Uh, so you think about that as developmental assets or as community assets. So an asset map is just trying to map out like what's yeah. going on. So we talked with thousands of churches around the world and just tell us everything, everything you're doing, like different kinds of programs, your, your use of technology, like all kinds of stuff. And in that research, we really had a few big aha insights that were, that were global in nature. And, and those insights have really shaped our subsequent thinking now for, you know, for the last almost 10 years. Yeah. The first insight that we had is that most churches weren't growing appreciably in children and youth ministry. Like their kids weren't growing. Hmm. Just like people out there are having kids, but they're the, 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 the numbers typical, aren't growing or the, the typical the, churches, children and youth populations were flat. Wow. And we defined flat as growth of less than 5% per year. Okay. So, so that was a, I mean, like, that's already a stop the press. Like, okay, wait. Because you'd expect it. We, we thought it would be growing because these churches were doing outreaches. They were doing street evangelism. They're preaching the gospel. They're connecting with schools. They're yeah. doing stuff. But boy, like at, at the end of the day, if the goal is to assimilate in families, to disciple children, youth, and families, to retain them within the church, then at some level, you have to look at how many are you reaching every year and how fast are you growing? And what we saw consistently was they were reaching a lot, reaching a lot of young people, but they weren't growing. Hmm. And so that meant, okay, something, something in here is a problem. It's a disconnect. Yeah, there's a disconnect, right? So if you if you're a local church and you go, yeah, we're we're reaching a, a hundred children and youth every year, I go, okay, well, like would you say over that? And all of this is them just telling us, right? Like yeah. we're not evaluating them. We don't have the right to evaluate them. We're asking them questions and they're telling us what they want to share with us. And we're asking small, medium, large churches, different denomination churches. Like yeah. we're really trying to be thoughtful about let's do a really good sample so that we're hearing from a, a broad population within all these countries. We went to over 40 countries. So thousands, almost what? 13,000 churches that we talked to. And, um, and so, yeah, they were reaching lots of kids, but they weren't growing. So that was the first thing we paid attention to. Second thing we paid attention to is we said, hey, what are your biggest needs? 
you know, and there's certain things you kind of predict, right? Like, like a lot of people are like, you know, they work with children. You think like, man, I wish that my pastor cared more about children. You think, yeah. I feel you on that one. Um, other people said, man, I wish I had more resources, more money. We're like, Hey, I feel that. But, but we kind of were looking for other things that maybe as, as global ministry leaders, like, like YWAM, like Incredible Global Network, as One Hope, others, like something we could do something about. And, and a few popped up really big. One of them was, I really need training for, um, for my staff and volunteers. Hmm. We're like, hey, that is something that we could do something about. Yeah. So beginning in 2018, 2019, we began to get very, very systematic in offering completely free training all around the world. Uh, in children, youth, and family ministry. And we wow. continue doing that. Uh, I think you've already got this vibe, but like we're partnering with other great ministries. They're donating content. Nobody's getting royalties from any of it. All yeah. of it's just given away. You can have it all. Uh, we even branded it somebody else's brand so that people didn't feel like we're being all whatever. Like just give it away. Mm. So we started doing that and that was a big one. How do we, so that was over, it was like 45% of respondents said one of their greatest needs was training for um, staff and volunteers. So we started giving away training yeah. uh, in person, online, all the above. Second thing that we saw was they said, um, I need I need better knowledge of practice. Like I feel like like what we're doing is the same thing we've always done. And yeah. we, we felt that. So it's like, okay, how do we make the goal that we want every local church to have access to a model of discipleship, evangelism and discipleship for children, youth, and families in their community that's relevant for their circumstances. Yeah. So if you're working with, you know, orphans, you need one type of model. If you're working with diaspora, you need a different type. If you're working with refugees, you need a different type. Wow. If you're working with people who've been trafficked, you need a different type. And so trying to begin accelerating the availability of these different models yeah as best in class as we could find looking around at any of our partners, any of our friends, but sort of saying to ourselves, like, you know, the job's not done. If, if our theory of change is, Hey, help a local Christian community reach local children, youth and families. If the average church isn't growing, yeah, then we have a problem and we need to take that burden on. Like we could be like, not our problem, but it is our problem. So, so for us, it was like, okay, how do we make sure every church has access to a model that they believe is relevant for their context? Third thing we heard is, how do I get access to just higher quality resources? Yeah. Which is, there's nicer yeah. materials, more beautiful. We continue to do that. We're accelerating other people doing that. I mean, there's just growing, there's growing consortiums and networks and partnerships who are all saying, let's make the resources yeah. available. So Bible Media Group, like, a great example is um, there's this beautiful uh, uh, visual canon of scripture called Lumo. It's like 13 hours long, and the owners of it are like, everybody can work with this. So now there are mm. hundreds of ministries that have access to gorgeous HD cinematic presentation of scripture. Yeah. And now there's a new one coming out called The Covenant on the Old Testament. So like just people making, like getting radically generous, yeah. completely open-handed, like whatever it takes. Another thing that we saw, and one of the ones that really frustrated us, and maybe one of the most dear to, to YWAM, um, we've known for a long time that one of the strongest leading predictors that a young person is going to stay with the church and stay mm, with the faith yeah. is that they feel needed. Right, so Fuller Youth Institute will describe this as needed as, in the church or yeah, needed yeah needed any... in the church. So so whoever needs them, that's where they're going to belong. Wow. So if the team needs them, if a sports team needs them, that's Whoa. that's where they belong. If their friend group is the only one that needs them, that's where they belong. Holy cow! Yeah, it makes so much sense. So much sense. All of us want to be needed. Yeah. All of us want to matter, right? And it's not. I mean, unless we're narcissistic, like all of us want to give our lives for something bigger than ourselves. And so we look around our world to be like, who needs me? Like, yeah. who, who could I lay my life down for? Even secularists ask that, right? That's not just a Christian question. That's a human question because we're made in the image of God and God is love and he's fundamentally generous. Like that is part of the human condition. So, so we found out from lots of research that this really pr strong predictive indicator that a young person is going to stay with a community, yeah. and, and in this case with the church community, is how much they feel needed. And here's what we saw. 
the majority of churches, so it's 57%, 57% of churches had activated less than 10% of their young people for any form of service. Wow. Service in the church, leadership in the community. Any, I mean, I'm talking to youth with a mission. Yeah. Right? Like, we, we're with you. We believe that young people have and will continue to change the world. Right. And it's, it's the job of, of old guys like me to cheer them on and coach them as it's helpful. Yeah. God made them for spiritual battle. God made them for sacrifice. He made them for pioneering. He made them for entrepreneurship. And we see that. And here's literally in 40 countries talking to 13,000 churches of every denominational stripe, small, medium, and large urban, rural, all the above chosen very carefully to be a good sample, 57% had 90% of their young people sitting on the bench. Saying, unintentionally saying, we don't need you. Yeah. Like, wow. I I don't know what they think they're saying to the young people, but I promise you that's what the young people are hearing. Wow. Now, have you you been able to follow up with churches where you've implemented? You've seen these different things. We need resources. We need training. Uh, hey, you're not using your young people. Have you followed up? Is there an impact when yeah, they so apply these? So I would these? say where we're at now is, I mean, it's like we're on a long journey. And we can see some of the early exemplar churches where they're, they're beginning to change their, their, their ministry practice and their, and their theology of, of youth engagement and empowerment mm. and leadership. And the results are tremendous. They're tremendous. So... You know, there are churches in East Asia, there are churches in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's churches in Latin America that we've looked at and and where where it's happening, the results are striking. And it's not surprising. You know, I think most pastors out there think that their biggest competition is the church down the road and they're crazy. Their biggest competition is sports. Because if I join sports, you know what? They need me. I don't, I'm not, I'm not sitting on the sidelines watching. I'm on the field playing. I'm always at the center of the action. It's the most, uh, for, for obvious reasons, it's the most perfectly gamified ecosystem yes. available to most adolescents. Let me go do sports. You know what's not hard to get young people to do? Sports. Yeah. So here's my question then. Like, why and what could we learn from that? How about we start putting young people on the field? How about we start inviting young people to be the players and the adults be the coaches? How about we figure out ways Whoa. to empower them to, to lead and to be celebrated for their capacities? Do they need to grow? Yeah, they need to grow. Great. That's fine. Like, that's fine. We all need to grow. Like, yeah. Welcome to the club. Welcome to being here. <laughs> um, if we could think about that as our guiding metaphor instead of classroom. Yes. So here's the big challenge, right? So (laughs) one of the unintended consequences of the Sunday School Movement. Um, Sunday School Movement's amazing. And I'm I'm so thankful to the Lord for it. And and like lots of things, it serves the Lord in its day. But if we take the wrong lessons from it, then pretty soon we're worshiping a bronze serpent in the wilderness and God's getting mad at us. So like we got to be kind of careful with this stuff. And... As, as school grew around the world, what the church began to do was it began to model its engagement of young people based on the metaphor of the classroom. So sit quietly, answer my questions. I'm going to teach you Bible trivia, and, uh, and, and I'm going to give you a gold star if you know all the answers. Oh, gosh. And that became our like yeah. discipleship. What did Jesus do? Surrounded by a bunch of arguably teenagers. I mean, if we take the whole idea that the the, the coin in the fish's mouth, temple tax, so Peter's the one who does yes. it, right? Like pretty young. What does Jesus do? Come walk with me. Get started. Now it's your turn. Oh, you failed. All right, let's talk about it. Yes. You still argue about who's the greatest. Like, now I'm gonna send you out. Come back. Let's debrief. Like, yeah. If we would think about discipling children and youth through a metaphor like Christ used. Or if that feels too alien, let me give you a more proximate one. If you would be a coach 
And you would treat the young people in your church like a sports team and come up with roles and rules and let them loose. You will not only change their lives, you will change the life of the community within which your church is located. Gosh, that's so good. And it's obvious though, isn't it? Like you think about it and you're like, well, like I don't have to plead with my kids to go play because Mm -hmm. when they play any game, when they play, it's fun. It's play. Yeah. It's the center of the action. I don't have to discipline them for stopping play. I don't have to bribe them to get them to play. Yeah. It's play. If discipleship becomes play, then discipleship gets transformed. Yeah. Gosh, that's good. Right? Okay, so I want to circle back to this question that I had about why young people, why the Bible. Just paint the picture. I mean, one, I'm thinking... It, Young people, they're they're moldable. They're building the worldview. It's a yeah. it's a key time. Yeah. Uh, but then, just paint the picture. How many people don't have any access to the Bible, or maybe it's translated, but they're yeah. not engaging with it? Yeah, no, I, I, it's a great it's a great question. So, so I told you about the second big research study that we did in 2015, the asset mapping research. So then we did a third big study, and we just finished it right before COVID. By God's grace, like we literally finished collecting the data. And like three months later, the world shut down. Hmm. And uh, we intentionally designed it. We wanted to do a second, like a second wave of the of the attitudes and behaviors of youth, right? That that big study, like the two hundred fifty thousand yeah. person study. We we wanted to do a second wave of it, but we 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 wanted to think really carefully about okay, who would be the most strategic population that we could talk with to understand what the future looks like. Mm -hmm. So we went after urban, digitally connected, young adults. We went after exactly the kind of person that is so often drawn to YWAM. We're looking at 19 and 20 year olds living in cities, digitally connected, breaking out their phone on social media, living the modern lifestyle. We didn't go to villages. Villages are important. We didn't go out to the countryside. Countryside's important. We didn't go after disconnected people because we thought if we want to understand where the world's going, yeah. this is who we look at. This is our leading indicator. So we went after the 19-year-old guy or girl, digitally connected, urban environment, modern young person, but around the world. So we went to country after country, but looking for that kind of profile. And we found some really big insights, right? So we call that the global youth culture. And by the way, if you're checking into this, and I'm, I'm happy uh, to give it to you, yeah. all of this research is available, and it's all free. Like it, uh, The price is like an email address. Like If you give us an email address, you can yeah. have millions of dollars worth of research for free. Like, Lord bless you. Deal. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not trying to make it hard. We just want to know that someone got it. And um, anyway, so we did the global youth culture. Uh, study and here was the big here was the big takeaway the big ta- and and by all means like like I, I know I'm being kind of like we're having fun but um, we have the global youth culture broken down by country mm-hmm. we have it broken down by region we have global findings so if you're a missional leader out in the world listening to this podcast if you're in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, if you're in Brazil, if you're in Southern Asia, East Asia, Eurasia, Europe, if you're out there, please take a look at what we're talking about because the findings are striking. And I'm going to give some, some global insights. But of course, if you go and look at your region or your country, you're going to get way more relevant insights yeah. for your actual work. Here was the biggest takeaway that we wrestled with. The biggest takeaway that we wrestled with is out of this big sample of thousands of digitally connected urban young people, young adults, um, only 7% met a basic definition of committed Christian. So uh, we use the same, um, you know, how do you, how do you define committed Christian? Yeah. Right? Like you can imagine. So, so in research, What the standard practice is, is that everybody who does research tries, if they're responsible, we try to use the same definitions, right? Because then you can compare this study with that study, you know, and you can sort of build trends and it's, it's way more useful. It enriches all of us if we'll just use the same definitions. Yeah. 
So we adopted Barna's definition, which was the which was the the most widely used definition of a committed Christian, and and it was just six things. It was four beliefs and two practices. That was it. Wow. What I are read, the two practices? I, I read the Bible once a week. I pray once a week. Wow. Okay. Seven percent. Holy cow. Of urban, digitally connected young adults out there, seven percent met those criteria, and I believe God exists. I believe Jesus is his son. Yeah. I believe that forgiveness of sins is through Christ. I mean, we're not talking like really elaborate stuff yeah. here, right? Wow. At the most basic level of committed Christian, it was 7%. In Latin America, it was 3%. East Asia was 4%. Oh, my gosh. North America was 8%. Sub-Saharan Africa was 28%. Holy cow. It's unbelievable. And so... You know, for those of you who are sort of follow missiological trends, yeah. you'll know via incredible researchers like Philip Jenkins, you'll know that right now the global center of Christianity is around the Central African Republic. Uh, it used to be in Accra, Ghana. It moved uh, a little a little east and a little south. Like, like that's the center of, of Christianity. The center of Christianity isn't like the Midwest U.S. No. The center of global Christianity is in sub-Saharan Africa. Whoa. And it was profound to us to see 28% of digitally connected, urban. So we're not talking rural, yeah. like, oh, no, no, no. No, apples and apples. 28% of digitally connected urban young adults in Africa met a definition that for the rest of the world, we were struggling to get double digits. Wow. So for us, that has profound implications as a yeah. ministry. And I would say for any of us as missional practitioners, what happens in Africa is really important. Let me take a quick pause and just share about Africa. If if you're, if you want to change the world, there's a really good argument that one of the places to be is in Africa. By 2050, Africa will have as many people under 25 as the rest of the world combined. Let me say that one more time. By 2050, in 25 years, 27, sorry, math, 27 years from now, it is estimated that sub-Saharan, not even north, sub-Saharan Africa will have as many people under 25 as the rest of the world. Oh my gosh. 50%. 50% of the world's young people are living in sub-Saharan Africa. And part of that's because they're growing and part of it's because the rest of the world is falling off of a demographic cliff. Yeah. Right? So the big thing that happens in a country is you move from the rural area to the urban area. And the first thing you do is you realize that you can't afford a very big house and everything's really, really expensive. So you have fewer kids and your wife gets educated and so she's like, man, I'd really love to work a little bit. And so she has fewer kids and wow. you're not working a farm. So kids aren't farm hands. So you have fewer kids. So everybody suddenly has fewer kids and that's happening all over the world. But in sub-Saharan Africa, they're still growing. And so what's going to happen is because of their growth and everyone else's decline, suddenly we wake up in 2050 and half of the young people in the world live in sub-Saharan Africa. Wow. So for us as, uh, as, People trying to change the world. Yeah. We'll stay with that topic. That's a good topic. Um, Africa is one of the places to be. So by 2050, you've got over half a billion uh, young people in East Africa, another half a billion in West Africa, 400 million in Southern Africa. I mean, it's the numbers are gigantic. Wow. And um, so that's a place to be. So, so what else did we see in the... Uh, global youth culture, um, we saw that in a lot of areas of young people's lives, God's word um, and and being a committed Christian, right? Just, just the simplest practices once a week, lower rates of mental health, lower rates of anxiety, lower rates of depression, lower rates of suicidal ideation, lower rates of suicidal attempts, hmm. like across the board, Factor after factor after factor. And, and this was not surprising to us. So probably uh, 20 years ago, 
there was this massive research study that came out of all of the uh, secular universities in North America. So like the Princetons and the Harvards and the Dukes and the Yales and whoever else. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to call anybody secular. I'm just, forgive me, Duke. Like, I'm just like saying like, like not like, you know, not like the Bible colleges, yeah. right? So like big Ivy League schools, they put out this giant research finding in the early 2000s and they said, they predicted that there was a mental health crisis, a mental health tsunami that was coming for the West. They predicted it. And they said that the great challenge was that we were losing authoritative communities. So we're like, hey, wow. what's an authoritative community yeah. like? That sounds like it's a pretty big deal to lose. And it's like, well, an authoritative community is a, a community of people who think about... Uh, religion and faith and are led by non-expert practitioners and have a strong tradition of intergenerational engagement with children and youth. And like, they're talking through all this. And I was like, wait, 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 you guys are full of crap. Like this is a church. Yeah. Like you, you're these highbrow, like liberal academics. So you can't say church, you call it an authoritative community, but I read your 10 planks and like, it's a church. Yeah. So, so that was fascinating to us. So we started paying attention in the early 2000s and we and we were looking at, Wow. The correlation, the relationship between scripture engagement, between family quality, yeah. and being embedded in a local church. And what we found out, we call it spiritual vibrancy, you could call it whatever you want. These three things, these are the big rocks. So okay. like what, whatever you're doing out Same there. Say one more time. Yeah. yeah. The big so, rocks. So, so the big rocks. So, so if, if you're thinking like, man, how do I really change the world? You're going to do a bunch of things and a bunch of things need doing. And that's cool. I'm not trying to get everybody to do the same thing. Whatever you do, what you should be bending it towards, what you should be thinking about is how do I get people into God's word? Yes. How do I get people's families strengthened? And how do I get them into church? And those so are, good. now those sound so traditional, right? Like, that, as someone who's arguing for innovation, like that doesn't sound exactly like super innovative. This is like, if the sun doesn't come up, we have yeah. a problem. This it's is how foundational. We it's how it, we work. It's absolutely foundational. And so with each of these, when you see their breakdown, and, and right now we're seeing the breakdown of all three in the West, right? Yeah. In like a North America setting. When you see the breakdown of these three things, you see the rise in prevalence of a host of, um, of really painful phenomenon. It's yeah. real, right? So like I remember, for example, like just to give you one example, because I know it's like helpful to get particularized sometimes. When we did the attitudes and behaviors of youth, we looked at the relationship between um, my mom and dad are divorced and I use drugs in the last 90 days. Yeah. It was one of the strongest correlations I've ever seen in the social sciences. Whoa. So if you think about like, picture like a, you know, like a 15 year old or 16 yeah. year old, right? Like how many, how many variables would go into whether or not they tr are using marijuana, right? Or getting drunk. Yeah. I mean, there's like 10,000 variables. 10, I mean, there's so many variables, right? Like where they live and, you know, who their friends are and, you know, what their availability is and, you know, if they're involved in like, I mean, there's just so many different things that would affect it. One third of the explanation was my mom and dad aren't together anymore. One third. One third. Holy cow. So when we're talking about these big rocks, right? Like authoritative communities, right? Local church, God's word, family. These yeah. are big things. These are really big. Fascinating. Things. And I would tell like, listen, like I, I had to do a bunch of school and, you know, it's not for everybody. Um, but there are mountains of secular research. You know, in the in that one that I talked about with authoritative communities, it was interesting. The, sorry, to finish the thought, there are mountains of secular research pleading with the church to act like the church mm. and to focus on the fundamentals, pleading for us to strengthen our families. Yeah. I mean, if you look at something like... Um, uh, Dr. Brad Wilcox's work on family composition. You can't imagine all of the things that are better about a young person's life if their family is intact, even if it's a lousy family. 
Like I, I'm not talking about physically yeah, abusive no. or sexually abusive. But but just like, you know, you might think like, well, you know, my family wasn't that great. Like your family could be lousy. It could be lousy. And and it's still an institution that was created by God for good. And God's spirit still uses it in your life. Yeah. And you wouldn't think so, but it's real. It comes out in the data. It comes out, it comes out so big in the data. Your likelihood of poverty escalates dramatically if your mom and dad are, are divorced. Your likelihood of being physically or sexually abused escalates dramatically. We even have things that we don't know how to explain. So, so you have biosocial effects. Like um, if, uh, if a mom and dad get divorced and a, and a new guy moves in as like a stepdad or maybe mm -hmm. a live-in, uh, any girl in that household, she'll enter puberty faster statistically. Her body will turn on because her body thinks that there's a new man, maybe maybe she's supposed to be married now. Like maybe, oh, and so we we have phenomenon happening that we're like. I mean, it's crazy. Like like in the research study that he put out on this was uh, 31 conclusions from his uh, research report, Marriage Matters. When he put this out, he's not he's not a Christian. Like, he's an academic. When he put this out, um, he didn't want to claim that this was like a. He was like, we're not sure why this is mm. but what we know is that there is a statistical relationship between the onset of puberty and whether or not uh the father the birth father is is the man living in the home very and interesting so you can't even imagine the, the the layers and levels of effect that happen when we deviate from god's design so if and what was fascinating to me in the authoritative communities report is that these researchers from all of these secular institutions, I read the report and then I, and then I read the subsequent book that came out a few years later and they were pleading, they hmm. were pleading with the church to act like the church. Wow. They were plead. They couldn't like, obviously they're trying to be secular, right? Yeah. They're trying to be neutral, non-religiously affiliated, but they were pleading for religious communities to re to effectively re-engage young people for the sake of the young people's lives. So hmm. now you fast forward, that's early 2000s, you fast forward to today. And if you're looking, if you're following the research with uh, like a Jonathan Hyde or um, uh, I'll think of the other lady's name in a sec, um, you know, instances of mental health crisis as measured by hospitalization for self-harm. So we're not talking about like, I feel sad. Yeah. We're talking, Seriously. I'm in the emergency room bleeding, have increased two to 400% among young people hmm. in North America at arguably the most affluent time in our nation's history. Wow. Why? Because families have fallen apart because young people are drifting away from the church and the church has no compelling way of going, what, what are we doing here? Like, yeah. like we've got to reclaim some of these things. So if you want to change the world, yes, use a thousand forms of innovation, use a thousand new programs, a thousand new strategies, a thousand new entrepreneurial efforts. But before you're done, try and answer this question. How can what you're doing curve back into getting people in God's word strengthening families and getting them into local churches. Yeah. So maybe that means planting a local church. Maybe it means partnering with a local church. And we, you know, again, like this isn't, I'm not arguing for a theological tenant that there's good theology for this. I'm arguing for this from the social sciences. Yeah. Like if you read the social sciences and, and the social sciences are trying to answer the question, how do you change the world? They will use a phrase. They will say it is asset based development. You're looking for who is the asset in this community and how do you develop them? And mm -hmm. that's why they call it asset-based development. In neighborhoods, they call it asset-based community development, but it's the yeah. same thing. And the, and the reason why that's so central is because for all of us, we, we come in, we do something there, and then we have to go. We can't stay. And so the most critical thing that any of your listeners could do is to, is to answer this question. How could I partner with a local partner Increase their capacity. Maybe that's improving their methodology. Maybe it's improving their training. Maybe it's giving them access to new technologies, uh, new innovations, like whatever. But how can I increase their capacities so that they remain in this community, mm. their engagement is improved, 
And then together we bend their work towards family, scripture, or church. Yeah. If you do those two things, if you partner with a local partner, if you if you improve them, you develop a local asset. Yeah. And then you bend their work together in a way that is non-exploitative, non-colonial, like like a true partnership. You bend their work towards family, scripture, or church. You are making a difference. You are changing the world. Whether you do the formative, like the formative assessment or not, I'm telling you, as the guy who who's out there on, doing yes. it, you are changing the world. You don't have to. That's me- what it you comes measure. Down. Just do those no, things, you and you're winning. Things. That is the recipe. Yeah, that's the recipe. And so, you know, someone will say, "Well, but Chad, you're not talking about God's spirit." Of course, I am. God's spirit is the one who inspired His Word, who says these are the priorities. Yeah. Guys, like like the priorities in Scripture are family, the Word of God, and the people of God. A global spanning family of families seeking the redemption and healing of the world in fulfillment of the giving of the Spirit in the second covenant in anticipation of the first fruits of the age to come. Like this is as Bible as you, this is as yes. Spirit as you can get. Yeah, This is fundamentally the leading of the Spirit given in the, in the new covenant where our hearts are exchanged from stone to flesh and we're invited to go lay down our lives for our neighbor and you go, okay, I'm ready to do it. How do I do it? That's what I'm trying to talk about. This is how you do it. Wow. Okay. I want to ask you one last question. These, uh, these young people in urban communities, digitally connected, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, discovery Bible studies and in rural villages, but how are young people in cities digitally connected? How are they most engaged in the Bible? How do you like, yeah, are people listening? They've got people around them right now. What yeah. can they do today? Be like, yeah. Oh, my friends at work, my friends at school, I've got these neighborhoods, yeah. a neighborhood across town. I know they need help. Yeah, I, I, so, I mean, let me, let me acknowledge, like, what a great opportunity for all of us to try a thousand different ways. So, mm. so what's going on out there? You have incredible phenomenon like The Chosen. Yeah. Where someone tries to reimagine the digital st- and rich storytelling. Right? I mean, you can't watch that and not love the story. It's just Absolutely. fantastic storytelling. And look at the hunger. Look at the response. It's unbelievable. But you also have incredible ministries like Alpha who are going, look, serve a meal, give everybody permission to doubt, and then have a conversation. And it's exploding. So you've got these wildly diverse models that are out there. I don't, I don't know if there's a silver bullet. Mm. I mean, the things that I think about are, you know, let's start with the fundamentals. Do they have access to scripture? Yeah. Is it in their heart language? Those are, those are pretty important things. Then I would say maybe on top of that, like, can we make it available visually? Because if, yep. they, if, they don't, if they don't read, here's the challenge, right? So when you're talking a lot of times with like the oral, um, when you're talking with the orality leaders, where I agree with them is the, the focus on oral people groups. But sometimes where I disagree with them is that the population you, you can be as sophisticated as any other person on the planet and not know how to read. So what yeah. you're dealing with is not a tribal person sitting around a campfire um, with no access to technology. What you're dealing with is someone who's, whose preference is not to read text and they're surfing YouTube for five hours a day or eight hours a day and they're listening to podcasts and Whoa. everything they're doing is still oral but it's not primary oral, it's secondary oral, right? Yeah. It's, it's accessing a library, a giant library of digital communication without needing to work through symbolic text. So from my perspective, I think one of the great things that we can do is just take really seriously like any effort to put out into the world visual translations or visual expressions that are dynamic and relevant and powerful and emotional. Yeah. Great music, great all of that. I mean, that's why we're... Working with uh, with Lumo, that's why we connect with Bible Media Group. I'm talking about my organization. Yeah. Like we're working with another organization called Bible Media Group that hundreds of ministries are working with. Like that's why we're doing it, is because we know that there is this massive uh, preference for dynamic content that is not restricted to a printed text. Yeah. 
And so we're doing that. I think people hunger for community. So I think that's what Alpha gets so right. Yeah. I mean, think about how biblical that is. Like, how's this for like a really innovative idea? Have a meal and celebrate my my life until I return for you. I got to tell you, that sounds kind of like a traditional concept. <laughs> like, Alpha is killing it. It works. It does. So, so I would say to people, like, I'm not trying to, to recommend like the silver bullet way to do it. I'm, I'm all for experimentation. I'm, yeah. I'm an experimenter guy by, um, by nature. Um, but, but keep the main things, the main things, right? So what we're trying to do is to help people really understand God's word. Mm-hmm. We're trying to help them do that in communities. We're trying to, we're trying to teach them obedience, not just trivia. So the goal of this is not like Bible trivia. The goal of this is what are these people doing out of what they've heard? So maybe we slow down on the content and speed up on the application. Yeah. Um, and then let's, let's innovate. Wow. Um, you know, here's what I would say. Here's if I could give one challenge to your listeners, here would be my challenge. Um, if, as a as someone who's been in this space now, I've, I've been with One Hope for uh, 23 years. Um, so I started when I was 26 years old. Mm. I did uh, uh, children and youth ministry for, prior to that, and then got uh, connected with the, with the people at One Hope. And then um, I've been uh, teaching missions, missiology, ministry practice, ministry innovation, ministry entrepreneurship, all that stuff for for a, a good long while. Mm. Um, and I'm the chair of the School of Mission at Southeastern University. So I've got these two roles. So here's here's what I would say. If, if, if I could challenge you to add one thing to what you're currently doing, here's my challenge. Um, what's your feedback loop? If you don't have a feedback loop, if you take your weight or your daily steps or your calories, like, like my fitness pal kind of yeah. thing, like... If you're monitoring that every day and you don't have a feedback loop on your ministry, what in the world are you doing? How do you know if you're successful? You have no idea. And people hate, listen, I've been there, right? So as a, as, <laughs> as someone who is haunted by like, I need to get enough exercise. I need to like watch my calories. Like I'm a really big dude. Like I, I got to do all of that. Um, as someone who deals with that, here's what I, here's the encouragement I want to give you. The goal is not to give you a report card. The goal is to give you a step count. Right? The goal is to the goal is to give you uh, an Apple Watch or a you know it, it's it's the feedback loop. That's what we're looking for. We're not looking for you failed. What we're looking for is what's working. What do you want to improve? Yeah. So if you don't have so in the technical language, this is called a formative assessment. In regular language, we call it feedback. Right? Yeah. If you don't have a feedback loop right now for whatever it is you're doing around the world, that's that's a prayer of repentance. That's yeah. a Lord like like help me. And people think, well, I, I don't how do I know? I don't I don't know the right thing. Try. Like I tell people all the time, um, if uh, the big difference is not the perfect assessment versus the average assessment. The big difference is the average assessment versus no assessment. Yes. So uh-huh. if I want to find out um, how the state of my marriage, I'm guessing that there's probably really good psychometrically validated instruments out there I've never reviewed. You know what I do? It's pretty, it's pretty sophisticated. Let me try and help you with this one. I go, hey, babe, my wife's Janine. <laughs> hey, babe, how we doing? And if I have ears to hear, she tells me. Yeah. And it's that simple. You know, the big, the, the big challenge is the zero to one. The big challenge is... Asking the question. Yeah. So what I would say to you so is good. if you're working with churches or young people or families or refugees or displaced or a, a thousand other expressions of the gospel around the world, if you don't have a feedback loop right now, my challenge to you is to say, who could I ask a question to? And would I want to hear the truth from them? And if you just start there, God's spirit will lead you the rest of the way. I promise the spirit of truth will lead you into all truth Mm. for the glory of the son. I promise you and for the deliverance of our world. Wow. Chad, that was fascinating. Where do, where do people find the research? What's the website? um, 
uh, I'll give you the, the link we can put in the show notes or whatever, but if you start with a globalyouthculture.net, I think that's probably where you can find a bunch. And if you just look up uh, One Hope, onehope.net, we'll have uh, links and tabs and whatever. Yeah. We'll, we'll help you get whatever you want. And all of it's free, all of it's for you because uh, because this is how you catalyze the movement. Yeah. You give it away. You give away, Paul says, I Come give on. myself away. Like, Gosh, that's powerful. Come on. That's good. Well, thank you. That was fascinating and challenging and provoking. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah.